Good morning. I am, uh, I think I'm more delighted to be here than you are. And I'm, um, well, partly because, if you haven't heard, in Toronto right now it's about minus 30. Um, I feel kind of like I've gotten a holiday at the beach. Uh, when I arrived and saw people walking around with um, no socks on and riding their bikes and shorts, I thought, oh, this is the best. Um, but I'm also delighted because I told my friend Bruce Pierce that I was going to be here at the Pierce Institute, and he was very pleased. There are a lot of uh, Canadians, obviously, who have come by way of uh, Scotland, uh, so it's really a pleasure to be here, despite the conversation that we're having today. And I will just start by saying, in, in many ways, it's, uh, it's been very interesting and exciting for me to hear from so many of you, um, both uh, directly involved in the work and indirectly, uh, to, to feel the sense of passion and the sense of um, urgency that people are um, uh, feeling right now in regards to poverty and in regards to food justice issues in Scotland and in the UK broadly. So um, for, for those of us who, and coming from places where this has been somewhat more entrenched, it really is a pleasure um, you know, to hear your energy on it. I'm going to keep track of the time because uh, we're going to see if I can get through this in about 30, 40 minutes and then questions. Um, but if uh, if you feel like interjecting, if there's a question that you have, uh, there are times when our languages are not entirely uh, clear to each other. The terminology I've tried to, to make as neutral as possible, but if there are things that then aren't clear, please feel free to um, heckle. I will feel like I'm at home. So that's all good. Um, so let me just see if I can do this. When I first got um, asked to come and participate, <clears throat> the notion was that perhaps there were things that Scotland could learn from Canada and ways that you might move forward that were different, perhaps not making the same mistakes that we had made. And I have to say that I thought, wow, it'd be nice to be invited for something that we're doing really well, um, like hockey or maple syrup, something like that. Um, but. I will tell you that uh, I am delighted to be able to offer anything that we can in terms of what we've learned, what we're practicing, um, and uh, anything that we can do to sort of affirm different directions that you might be inclined to take one way or another. It seems to me very clear that there is a, a, a very, very strong inclination towards social justice and to um, addressing this as soon as possible so that there isn't the same kind of entrenchment. Um, I'm not usually inclined to give the first word to Americans, um, but in this case, uh, partly because of their long-standing experience with food banks, um, uh, the same as Canada and, and a great many more, not surprisingly, uh, Francis Moore La Pay said this many, many years ago, hunger is not caused by a scarcity of food, but because of a scarcity of democracy. And then Mark Bittman, who is the New York Times writer, said this just in, uh, I think, in early January. And it was um, in reference to a conference that the New York Times had organized on food. And I think that, I mean, his point was very, very simple. It doesn't matter where you are in the world. If you've got $20 or you know, 20 pounds in your pocket, you won't go hungry. This is not about income. Uh, or this is not, sorry, this is not about food. It is only about income. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our context and how we got to be the organization that we are. Uh, this is who we are today. So this actually is our food bank. Um, and that's the group that you see there. We love pictures. We, love, we always love bringing people to the stop. We figure that once you actually see us in action, you will understand what we're all about. Um, so we love to actually bring people in and, and give them tours and have them participate, get them to volunteer. Uh, the, the group of people that you see here are a combination of community volunteers, our staff, uh, students as well, um, you know, people who are involved in a variety of different ways, and that, I'm pretty sure, is the height of the summer, uh, which is not a big surprise given the, the bounty that you see there, most of which is local organic food. But that's where we are right now. Um, where, we, uh, where we are right now, and you've now heard a couple of times in different iterations, our mission. Uh, you know, increasing access to healthy food, community dignity, and the challenge to inequality. These are the, you know, the essential elements of our work. Um, 
We, just for operational purposes, I will tell you, we work in two different sites. One of them is in the heart of one of the lowest income communities in the City of Toronto. We are referred to by um, uh, <laughs> colleagues in the public health department call us the diabetes capital of the city. Um, and our second site is our urban agriculture site, which is in a more affluent neighborhood. We have a greenhouse there, um, and it uh, adds to a little bit of organizational tension and, uh, and, and ambiguity because we operate in a fairly affluent neighborhood there, um, continuing to work with people in, in low incomes and provide uh, a variety of programs there, urban agriculture programs. There are about 35 people who work at the stop full-time. We have an operating budget of about $4 million, most of which we raise through fundraising activities. Um, and we have somewhere between sort of around 700 volunteers who work with us uh, over the course of the year, a core of about 300 on a, on a, regula a regular weekly basis. But this is where we started, not such a dissimilar place to where we are right now. A very small church uh, in the uh, Kensington Market neighborhood of Toronto in the late 1970s and early 80s. The founder of the stop, a man named uh, Father Cameron, Campbell Russell, who um, is still alive. I spoke to him just before I came here, and he was very pleased to know that I was coming, although somewhat dismayed to hear why. Um, Cam's very clear about saying that, you know, this was, uh, this was a problem that kind of came to the church congregation's attention. People were hanging around a little bit longer than usual. They realized that people were falling through the cracks and uh, needing to have conversations. So it's been referred to here already. Um, this will not be a surprise to most of you. There was a social connection that was essential in the work that needed to happen. And um, from the perspective of this particular church, they saw people on the margin and they literally wanted to get them back onto the page. Food was not the focus at that point. It started, he said, with a cup of coffee and then he and his wife would make sandwiches and it grew from there to be an organization that involved, uh, that established a food bank, one of the first in the country. But it's a really important part of who we are as an organization. We are about food, but we are about people more than we are about food. And the connection to people and the need for the conversation is absolutely essential to what we do. And the food is really almost secondary to that. It just happens to be a great tool for connecting with people, for building community, um, and for, for bringing us together. So the early philosophy that food was not the issue uh, and the food bank would not be the focus, um, these things, frankly, have remained very, very consistent for us, that despite the huge changes that have happened in the organization over the last 20 years in particular. Um, we are about the changes that can happen in individual people's lives that they identify for themselves um, with support. How do they move from the crisis, the crunch, the poverty, and how do we support them? And how do we change the system with them and with other allies? How do we change the, the poverty that, uh, that happens because of system failure? We work in three main areas. So we've identified them as food access, emergency food, food skills, and uh, education and engagement. And it's all about what happens over that meal, over the, either the food that we grow together, that we cook together, that we eat together. Uh, I've referred to the number of uh, volunteers that we have. About 70% of the volunteers who are at the stop on a regular basis are themselves um, participants or recipients of, of the programs and services. And it's a vital part of what we do, having people be involved in, uh, in, in the programs and the services in all manner of the organization. They're really, you know, sort of we are embedded together in, in the functioning of the organization. I'm going to tell you sort of step by step in terms of the work that we do, and so we'll start with the with the healthy food bank. Um, we uh, we are determined to keep our focus on emergency food to a limit. We don't, uh, despite the kind of potential to sort of have more and more hours and more and more days of service, we actually try and limit very intentionally. Um, that said, we still give out almost. 13,000 hampers of food, healthy food, every, every year, um, and that is to about 19,000 people, lots of families. Uh, it's, we only do it once a month, and it's about a three-day supply of food. 
It is as low barrier as we can possibly make it. There is no means testing ever. Uh, and the idea is that we, we have to, we are bound to ask for uh, you know, your address, where you live. But once we know where you live, we can say, OK, Sally, now I just need to know how many people are in your family. OK, so next time Sally comes in, and she can come in once a month, she'll be greeted. She says, I'm here, I'm Sally, and I'm food bank member number 74. Uh, come on in, Sally, have a cup of tea. We're, uh, we're going to get started in a little while. We don't ever ask what people earn. We do, on an annual basis, do a survey to ask people a bunch of different information, both about our programs and services, to find out um, what we can do better. And we also keep some demographic information about where, you know, where they are in the world and where they've come from. But it's never about, uh, it's never a means test. So again, you can see the food bank. We don't have enough space so that people can come in and, and choose for themselves uh, in the space itself. It's very small and crowded. But what we do do is call people up to the counter, um, and then they're allowed to choose whatever it is that's on offer. So uh, always we start with the, the juice or the milk. We always have eggs available, uh, pasta or rice with sauces, dried beans, canned beans. Um, we have over the course of time, and I know there are many of you who work in food banks, we have over the course of time said no to many donations. And we have moved uh, and fundraised lots so that we can say no. Um, there is almost nothing on the shelves that, um, that is particularly sugary processed. There are some, some small things. There's a small selection of things that uh, are quite refined, um, but it's really a very small sampling. Um, many, f many food banks in Canada have to have a sort of a, a diabetic or a special diet um, for food bank members. We don't have to because our food just is, is that healthy. And the big focus is on fresh food. Uh, and as I said, there is, I sort of often joke that there is in fact more local food in our food bank than my kids get at home um, because we have a number of different uh, relationships with local farmers. That means that we can actually get lots of, lots of fresh food in. And it has to be culturally appropriate. Um, I always love being at the counter in the food bank and realizing, depending on who's, who I'm working with, that you know the tomatoes are going to be completely irrelevant because they're from a community that doesn't really use tomatoes, whereas the ginger or the you know, sort of peppers are going to be exactly what they want. Um, and you know, with time, we've figured out what our community needs. They've told us what they want. Uh, and we're able to provide a very diverse amount of food. The other element of our food access is our drop-in. And uh, you know, the drop-in started because in the early 2000s, what we were finding was that people would come to the food bank. The food bank is kind of the gateway to the stop. So you come because, um, and as Sally said, you come because you have no choice in the number of people who will have held off for as long as possible, uh, but they, they can't hold off any longer. And so by the time they come to this food bank, the number of other things that have um, you know, gone wrong in their lives is substantial. So it isn't a crisis, it is that crunch. It is the absolute, you know, sort of absolute poverty that they're experiencing. Um, and they probably have gone through as many friends and family members as they can seeking support. And this is a last ditch effort. I remember one guy in particular who was a very active volunteer who just said, you know, I waited for as long as I could. And then I walked in the door and it was okay because people are made to feel as though they are welcome. We tend to welcome people by their first name. We know who they are. And if we don't know who they are, um, our staff are you know, sort of bound and determined to get to know who they are as soon as that's something that is comfortable. Um, that said, people would come and would be so hungry that they would actually be eating the contents of the food bank hamper before they even walked out of the building. And it was sort of one of those, wow, how did, how did it take us so long to figure it out? But we decided to start serving meals and snacks. It started as a relatively small part of our work, and it has grown into one of the things that we are most known for across the city. Four days a week, breakfast and lunch, available to absolutely anybody who wants to come in on a regular basis. You know, donors or visitors will say, well, does that mean that I can come and I'm not hungry? And we say, of course you can come. Anybody can come. We want everybody to come to our drop-in um, because we want people to be together, because we believe in communities building and getting stronger together. And we don't just want people who are hungry. We want anybody who is in the community who is interested in our work to come and be with us. 
The food is spectacular, I will just say. Uh, we are blessed by having um, the partnerships and the resources so that we, we can and do focus on delicious, healthy, nutritious food. Our assumption is this might be the only meal that you have all day, in which case we want to make it as nutritiously um, you know, packed as we can. We always have a vegetarian and a meat option, and so for those four days a week, we serve something in the neighborhood of a thousand meals. Oftentimes, the breakfast and lunch will be for the same people, and other times we'll have people who have walked from the far reaches of, of the other end of the city to get to us in time for lunch. Um, the referrals, somebody made a reference to uh, being referred to the food bank and the drop-in. The, um, the catastrophe that is our system right now is that we actually have doctors referring to our food bank because the food is so healthy. It is the best that they can do by way of prescribing for good health is to prescribe to our food bank, which of course is one of those, well, that, I guess that means we're doing a good job and, and what an incredible um, indication of how badly this system is working for people. This was just taken a couple of weeks ago. It's the, our celebration for the Lunar New Year. So, in the, uh, so our chef, Monica, is there. The um, volunteers that you see in the top left-hand corner, and that's a classic um, stop uh, volunteer story. One of them is a very affluent woman who is, makes regular donations to the stop, and she's there every single Thursday and works you know, like a dog. They all do. The Thursday crew, uh, our chef believes the Thursday crew could actually just own, run their own restaurant. I mean, volunteers come and come to regular shifts and stay in regular shifts for years at a time. So the Thursday crew were outstanding, and that day they made 600 dumplings to go with uh, the Lunar New Year celebration. The grandmother beside her is one of our community members, um, and uh, you know English is not her first language, and she sort of uh, struggled originally when she first came to be a volunteer, and has become part, you know, part of the community and part of the. Uh, uh, the whole, the activity at the stop. But that gives you a bit of an idea of the kind of food that we provide. And we do table service too, which is just in the uh, small, I'm trying to give you the little pieces that we have learned that sound kind of inconsequential, but for us, being able to tell people there's never going to be a lineup at the stop. You, you're welcome to come. If we can't seat you right away, please just have a seat over here. We'll get you a cup of tea or coffee. Um, and, uh, and as soon as we can get you a seat at a table, we will. And when we do, then the tables are nice big round tables and we serve you either a, a vegetarian or a, or a meat option. Um, but we, as much as possible, want people to feel as though they are, they are welcome and they are being taken care of. Um, so there are other things that happen in our drop-in, not surprisingly, after we finish the meals. Uh, this happens to be the day that Canada beat, I believe it was the U.S. in the, um, in the Olympics last year. Um, it was pretty ecstatic. I love this picture. Um, there, there are two, actually both of the people that you can see in this shot. Uh, Patricia and Pauline are both community members. Um, they're both now employed by the stop. Uh, Patricia uh, works part-time and Pauline is now working full-time and came out through our community advocacy program. Um, just started with us about two weeks ago. And uh, anyway, this is just a classic example of the drop-in. It's mayhem on a good day, on a bad day, a different kind of mayhem. Um, but this is the kind of energy that we have most of the time. Um, and needless to say, the World Cup is another big favorite. We have a lot of uh, soccer fans, football fans from around the world. The third part of our emergency or our food access is that we run a good food market. And this is similar to something I'm afraid I'm not going to remember the name, but when I was at Bridging the Gap on Thursday, they had a stand of fruit and vegetables that they had and that they sold at cost. I got some apples there. It was wonderful. Um, we do the same thing because our neighborhood, Davenport, is a you know, virtual food desert. Um, and though there is a little bit of food available, it's very, very hard for people to actually, um, you know, for many people to do bigger shops to get anywhere because the price of our transit is so prohibitive uh, or because they have mobility issues, whatever it happens to be. So once a week, we buy uh, food It's in a partnership with another agency. It, uh, it, it, some of it is local, but because it's year-round, it tends to be a variety of foods, and it's sold at a sort of a community function. We do it outdoors during the summer. We have a bake oven going with pizza or corn on the cob, and um, it's yet another opportunity for people to come together. And, uh, and you know, this photo, again, a combination of volunteers, staff, and students. 
So the other piece that we moved into after, after the, our time in the food bank was towards food skills. And this is a key piece of the work. Um, not, because, uh, not because necessarily people who are low income don't know how to um, you know, cook or, or feed themselves, but because it's an opportunity for people to do things together. And so whether it's in the kitchen or in the garden, um, this is a really big focus. We, we can teach not just about how to cook, but different kinds of foods, um, which is always uh, something that people are very excited about. 5,000 meals approximately in a bunch of different kitchens. Um, this is one of those things. I, uh, w people just come and drop in, so they will know about the healthy meals or the Sabor Latino or whatever the, ki the community kitchen is, and they arrive. Um, for many folks, it is the only time all week that they have a chance to eat with anybody else, and, uh, and it, it's, that's, that pretty much says it all. This is why we, we run these kinds of programs, because it is, for many people who are very isolated, an opportunity to come together, to sit together, eat, um, and to not be... Uh, not have, you know, sort of the, not just the stigma of poverty, but the, the absolute isolation that after years and years, people, I'm one woman who came to a community kitchen and said, this is the first time in almost 10 years that I've had a chance to sit down with anybody. Obviously, there is, you know, sort of n no amount of good health can come from that level of isolation. I, I wanted to use this picture in particular. This is Sabor Latino and... Um, uh, on a, every second week, a group of Spanish-speaking Spanish people come together from a variety of different communities. Um, there's always really loud, lovely music going in the kitchen. It tends to be that it's uh, older folks, men and women in the kitchen, the kids we've got a uh, crash or a childcare space for, and then younger people, oftentimes the, the children of, some of them that are working, some not, the children of the, of the folks in the kitchen will come and join us, sit in the drop-in and eat. Um, to say that this, you know, is a potential violation of the public health legislation would, is, you know, without question, there are sometimes 30, 40 people in the kitchen, people are dancing, there, you know, there's lots going on. And one of the reasons I love this picture so much is because the uh, fellow with the dark hair is one of our staff, Hussein, um, the, the man, all of the women and the, the, the rest of the people you see in the picture are all Spanish speaking, except for Terry, who's standing right beside him. And Terry is one of our kind of chronic volunteers. He comes to programs, he's around a lot, he's very enthusiastic, and he has, I'm sure, absolutely no connection to a Spanish speaking community. But there's Terry because he just shows up and he wants to be there, and he's just that kind of, uh, that kind of involved in, in the stop. So, community gardening. This has not always been what the STOP did, and I know there are lots of different programs here that uh, we've, I got to see a, a little bit of some of the community gardening that's going on here. This really changed our organization enormously when we started to think about community gardening. It happened quite um, coincidentally. Uh, somebody from one of the local parks came to the STOP and said, we've got this bocce ball court that nobody's using. Do you guys want to take it and grow something? And it was one of those moments that, you know, the light bulb goes on um, where all of a sudden that then became, again, food is the symbol, a means for connecting. So the immigrant communities, lots of Italians and Portuguese in that neighborhood, Jamaican, variety of different folks who, who were gardeners, um, some of whom had their own gardens, many of whom did not have gardens, did not have, you know, any, anything like that kind of space, could come into the community garden and, and begin to plant and work together. And it is one of the oldest community gardens in the city of Toronto the Earl's Court, I've got a picture a little bit later on, but it began our understanding of uh, our work with food as being more dynamic, uh, not just than they sort of, you know, the food bank or the drop-in, um, but, but connecting us to food, you know, sort of earlier upstream, so to speak. Where, where does it come from, and how can we work to have more of that with the people that we're working with, and have them sort of figure out what their relationship is to growing food as well. So the urban agriculture part of our work started uh, when, we, when we got that bocce ball court. It's about a ton of food that we grow every year at that original park and a couple of other ones as well, um, including in our greenhouse, which is the 3,000 square foot. Um, we divide it up, so everything that we harvest is divided between the people who grow the food and the stop itself. So up until really sort of uh, the end of October, November, we, we have stuff that we're pulling out of the ground. I gather you're still doing that here. It's incomprehensible to me, but that's wonderful. Um, but we have, we have food coming out of the gardens, and food is going home with our community members as well. 
This is the celebration of the 15th anniversary. It was just this past year. These are mostly community members. There are a couple of students in there. Um, I only see one staff person, but that's kind of, that's what our gardening tends to look like, uh, is all kinds of different people who are there who are bringing their, their skills, their interest, or their lack of skills and interest. <clears throat> there are a couple of programs in particular where we are bridging communities and bridging demographics. Uh, so this is, um, this is one of those. It's the Global Roots program that brings together seniors from immigrant communities to, um, to work with younger people uh, who, and it's almost a sort of a mentoring program of sorts, although we're not really sure who's mentoring who, um, but there is a, a, an amazing dynamic that happens and each of the community groups, different demographics, so we have a Polish garden and a Somali garden and a Italian garden and the, the funny thing is of course that after a number of years the Polish gardeners are asking the Somali gardeners about what they have planted and then all of a sudden you see something in the Italian garden that really has absolutely no business there whatsoever except that they're all now so excited about the things that they have learned to plant that they're, there's a lot of cross-pollination but lots of world crops as well. Um, this is inside the greenhouse. One of the other things that we do is plant thousands of seedlings and give them away. I think that we figured out that it was something like, um, I can't remember what the number of pounds of food that we estimated. Each of these seedlings goes to a community garden and we did the math on how much food could potentially grow. Um, and it was an enormous amount. The, uh, this is more of the global roots. One of the things that, one of my favorite stories about this was that one of our staff at one point was a Tamil woman, and she came to me. She'd lived in Canada for 20 years, and she, she came to me and she said, do you know what this is? And I said, no, and she said, it's a, it's a curry leaf. It's fresh curry. And I said, oh, that's great. She said, I've lived in this bloody country for 20 years. I didn't know we could grow this here. I can't wait to tell my mother. Um, and, you know, it, that's the kind of work that happens in the gardens, people coming together and kind of understanding each other's, each other and, and opening all of this up for us, as, for us who are, you know, sort of Canadian-born as well. All right, our education and engagement, a lot of this harkens back to um, the, the kind of impact that we can have with, with families. And, uh, and so we work with young people in our greenhouse and in after-school programs. We provide a social justice framework for the, uh, the work that we do. We tend to work with grade five students. There's a, a bit of a, a tipping point magic moment for that age group where we can talk about health issues, where we can talk about um, food issues and, and social justice in a way that really seems to have an enormous impact. And it then trickles down into the rest of the family as well. And we work with somewhere, in, it, it, it's just under a thousand kids a year, but hundreds and hundreds of them. And to watch, this is, uh, you don't get the full sense of it, but to watch them go at it with knives and learn how to use knives and learn about different things in the kitchen. One of the programs that we had had a great um, a macaroni and cheese competition. So we had the craft dinner versus the homemade, and they went through the whole process and then had to actually choose which one they liked more. And not surprisingly, by the end of the class, the majority of the kids chose the homemade, the scratch macaroni and cheese. But if you don't go through the process, they don't necessarily understand that they're not, they're not getting ripped off. They actually are getting something healthier. Um, and all of the work that we do with kids, there's a great uh, American guerrilla gardener uh, who had, you know, sort of referred to just the impact it has if kids are connected to, you know, the worms, the earth. If they plant kale, they'll eat kale. The impact for kids of connecting to them to healthy food much earlier in their lives is enormous. And then our perinatal work. Um, actually started at the stop about 25 years ago. It was a bit of a model that the Canadian government, the Public Health Agency of Canada was looking at, um, working in low-income communities, what could they do, what kind of perinatal supports could happen, and the pilot that was so successful uh, that was run at the stop that it ended up being the model that was used across the country. Um, apart from the fact that it's uh, great to have kids around in the office, it's a couple of days a week. We have a lot of babies, we have a lot of little kids. Um, the result is, is, you know, the proof is in the pudding. 100% of the kids who go through this program of babies go through have a, hundred, have a healthy baby weight, which is, you know, as most of you I'm sure know, the, the best possible way we can start life for anybody and for the community. So then to the political work, the advocacy work that we do. 
And there are a couple of different parts to it. Um, Harkening back to the, you know, the counsel that we got from the, the founders of the stop, which is that this is always about a conversation. We work at a couple of different ways of having a conversation with community members and um, figuring out with them what kind of work we should be involved in. Um, one of the things that we do is a community action training, which is uh, really a way of kind of supporting people to find their voice and to speak out about important issues. So it is sometimes very practical work around speaking in public and sometimes it's about understanding what government, how government works um, and what legislation is about and how change gets made. We do that training once a year. There are usually about 10 or 12 people who uh, participate in the training and from that training I, I'm, I always lose track of the number of people who have gone on to become community advocates, peer-led peer advocates at the stop and then to staff as well. Um, either for the stop or other organizations. So we've really found that it's one of those um, kind of amazing, amazing programs that has a long-reaching effect. Um, the uh, advocates work at our site and two other sites. They log, I don't know, uh, oh, it's there, 2,200 hours a year doing referrals and uh, working with people, a little bit of case management, but mainly it's kind of connecting them to other um, other organizations, other opportunities. The majority by far of the issues that we deal with, not surprisingly, are housing and income. Um, it might be a, you know, sort of being ejected from their, their apartments, it might be a bed bug issue, it, any number of different things, but almost always housing and income. The other stuff is around how we talk about this work with the community both right at the stop and beyond. So there's a small group of um, dedicated community member volunteers that call themselves the Bread and Bricks group, and they tend to organize around particular issues. It might be transit fairs, it might be right now, I know they're doing a piece of work around homelessness, um, but they come together and sort of drive a bit of a process in how to have, uh, how to have some influence one way or another on issues that are in, in their minds top of mind. We did a great event in the last municipal election that was largely driven by the Bread and Bricks group as well with local candidates. Um, and unfortunately, uh, in January, when one of our, um, one of our community members uh, died, uh, he froze to death outside, um, literally a stone's throw from the stop in an abandoned truck. Um, the uh, community members from Bread and Bricks were the ones who organized a vigil and who spoke on behalf of the organization to the media. Um, the last thing that we have just started in the last year is a speaker series because while we talk uh, a great deal with our community, we also want to make sure that we're, we're moving forward with the rest of the city. We know that we have a great deal of support and we want to have a conversation with others outside the city and get them to engage in our issues. So we've started a, a, a series called the Food for Thought Speaker Series and so far uh, very, um, you know, sort of very popular, the, the one that we've had and the one that's coming up. Um, but we hope to have that be yet another tool for uh, moving, moving the bar, so to speak. I love this quote. I thought I would uh, add it. It comes just from last week. Our community um, advocates had a graduation. Uh, a group of them graduated, and so the, this seemed apt. Uh, the notion of having to plunge in and to, uh, to just join the dance, even if we don't actually know the answers, right? Uh, these, this is one of our staff and one of our community advocates. As I said, they staff uh, at, at our site and two other sites as well throughout the week. And um, this is one of the rallies that was held. The woman that you see in the picture, whose name is Nadia, uh, came to us, came to the stop originally uh, as a participant, maybe in the Healthy Beginnings in the perinatal program, I'm not sure. She, was, she used the food bank. Uh, she was active as a volunteer. She went to the community action training program. She became an advocate in that program. She then was hired by the stop. And then she left the stop because she's in nursing school. And uh, I often joke with her that she is, you know, just going to be a thorn in the side of the system for as long as I can imagine. She is that. Uh, that much of a firebrand and that she was able to find some of that voice and some of that way forward through the stop is one of the things that is, uh, is, is just wonderful. So 35 years later, this is how long we've been doing this, unfortunately. Um, 
we still believe that food is that essential connection. It is how we build community. It is how we build health. Um, and it's a great way of building allies, even in unlikely places. But we also still believe that food is not the issue, and I don't think that I need to convince anybody, anybody, anybody in this room of that fact. Um, you are looking at your new normal, uh, and uh, you know, in the in the sort of examples that are being, I gather, in something that I, I think it was in the. The, the British report that was out recently, and forgive me, I'm not going to remember the name, but there was this sort of notion, or there has been some notions of this example in Canada and Germany of food banks um, being used um, as being some kind of a justification for uh, the UK having them as well. In 35 years, we've gone from the, the first one in 1981 and the stop shortly thereafter to 450 food banks in Canada. Um, our population, about 10% of Canadians, 4 million people, are food insecure. And not surprisingly, a third of them are kids. We spend as a nation $7 billion on poverty-related illnesses, so diabetes, chronic hypertension, obesity, all kinds of things that are very eminently treatable with uh, an adequate diet. So here's what we know. Um, despite the most extraordinary efforts from our community members, uh, generous volunteers and, uh, and really passionate people who come to the food bank, who make donations, and who are part of our organization, we can say quite clearly that food banks don't work at addressing food insecurity. Um, the list there that you see, those are referred to by Janet Poppendike, the American writer who um, wrote the book Sweet Charity, Emergency Food and the End of Entitlement. Now, she wrote that book almost 20 years ago. She was talking about the American system, but at that point, she said, here are the seven deadly ins to emergency food. And I don't think that they will be a big surprise. Insufficiency, inappropriateness, nutritional inadequacy, instability, in inaccessibility, inefficiency, and indignity. Here's the problem with, with emergency food. What we can tell you for sure from the Canadian perspective is that of those four million people who are food insecure, only about a quarter of them actually use food banks, um, either because they don't have access to them in their communities, but mostly, as we understand it, because of the stigma of using a food bank. They just don't want to. Um, they don't think it's going to be okay. They don't feel like it's all right for them, and they don't feel like they're going to be welcomed and, and or treated with any kind of cultural appropriate food and or behavior. We also know that the hampers that people get um, will only actually provide them with about 10%, between 9 and 10% of what they need over the course of the month. So although that's better than nothing, um, the problem is that it really doesn't actually change whether or not they're food insecure. It means that they continue to be, by definition, food insecure, which means that they are continuing to skip meals or um, you know, having to feed their kids less or having to use other meal programs, whatever it happens to be. And this is based on Canadian research. It's not, it's not just the STOPS experience. It's, it's national research I'm talking about. So as much as food banks don't work at addressing food insecurity, what we know is that they do work in other ways. They work at bringing people together. They work at demonstrating, and that is clear and already been said here, that there is a community response that finds it to be an unacceptable approach. Um, we need to leverage that support. We need to leverage all of that, what comes in the door from the people who, who want to make a donation, who want to spend hours, who want, they don't, you know, I think that this is in some ways complicated for people who know simply that they see something wrong, they don't know what else to do, they're prepared to put that much in, let's help them get to the next level of what needs to happen, let's help, help us all to sort of find a consensus on how we actually make the change that we need. I know that there's a lot of passion in Glasgow because I, after a meeting yesterday, I went over to the Kelvin Grove Museum, and as I was asking for a little bit of advice on where to go next, the woman behind the information desk asked me where I was from and what I was doing here. And when she found out I was presenting on food banks, she started right in. I'm not sure if her husband's in the room. He, she said he might be, but oh, here, there he is. She was calling for, um, for an uprising, for a revolution. She was so appalled by the notion that there would be food banks in Glasgow and Scotland at the time. And she assured me it would be peaceful, but um, 
it was, it was so reassuring that a complete stranger in literally, I think it took her about 45 seconds before she said, we just can't have this. And, and in Canada, I'm, you know, it, it, it is not a question. We have it. Everybody assumes that it's fixing the problem. Everybody assumes that somehow, you know, we have food banks. It's not great, but we've got them, so people aren't hungry. People are hungry. The food banks don't fix it. And they can't. They can't. So you shouldn't let them stay in the way that they are, and you shouldn't let the government off the hook. Um, yesterday... I, w I was asked to tell you a little bit about the stop, and, and now I'm going to tell you a little bit, you know, more, perhaps more than you want to hear, but, but forgive me. Yesterday, or on a couple of days ago, I was on the BBC, and at some point the interviewer said, don't, don't we worry that this will create a dependence, that people will become dependent on food banks? And it's been a little while since I've had the question quite in that way, and so it took me a moment, and I didn't say what I should have said, which is, we absolutely should be having a, you know, a conversation about dependence. We should be worried about the dependence, but not the dependence that individual people have on food banks. The dependence that governments then boldly, brazenly allow to have happen. How is it possible that we have governments that say essential infrastructure can be, if it works out, a charitable option? How can my ability to feed my children depend on your ability to make a contribution? It's a, it, 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 there is nothing about this that is acceptable, and so we have to call out dependency, but I think it's not about the people who are hungry and who have been left to struggle in poverty and who are, I have to say, the language around sanctions. I can't even, I, I've, I've, I, it took me a little while to actually understand what you, were, what you meant. I always think of sanctions as being something that happens, you know, to foreign governments. We sanction people who are doing something that is, you know, the, the, the dictatorships of the world. We sanction governments that are so absolutely reprehensible. The idea that we would be talking about sanctioning individuals in our own, in our own country, um, our neighbors, because they are, you know, sort of falling short in these surreal prescriptions. Uh, I just, I'm. It, it's quite shocking. That maybe one of the most shocking things for me is just the use of that language um, by the government on its own people. Anyway, if for no other reason, if you can't actually get through and pass the idea of how much this is not the solution that we need, um, we need to be very clear as well about the health outcomes that will happen, right? We know that if we don't invest in ourselves and in our, in, you know, whether it's transit or anything else, we're going to have some fairly dire consequences. And the consequences will be the poor health, so the $7 billion. So if you can't, if you're not winning this argument on any other front, and I, it doesn't sound to me like you have to get there, but alone, in some ways, the only thing these days that's compelling in Canada is the notion that we are literally sort of, you know, good money after bad because people are going to be sicker and sicker and sicker the longer we allow this to go on. If you're in the throes of the food bank, though, and uh, just yesterday somebody said, you know, you, how, how do you get ever to sort of look past the immediacy of the day-to-day -day because the crush is always there. Um, there is always a, a giant need. And so, frankly, I think it's a challenge. There's a lot of ambiguity that you have to hold if you're going to be in this world. Um, for us, there is a constant need to say, this is not acceptable, and we always need to have one foot on the gas um, pushing us towards social change. We always need to be thinking about where we can go next and how we can challenge. And I will just tell you that while we don't have sanctions in Canada, what we do have right now is a conservative government that is um, so intent on regulating the activities of, of charitable organizations that we are um, we could lose our charitable status, which means that we wouldn't be able to fundraise at all, uh, um, if we work towards the eradication of poverty. That is political, and we're not allowed to do that. We can't eradicate poverty. We might be able to alleviate it, but we are not allowed to eradicate poverty. So while you have your sanctions, we have that kind of Orwellian doublespeak. Apparently, it's good for us to have poverty, and so that's why the federal government wants us to not actually eradicate it altogether. 
Um, when you're thinking about the kind of work that you're doing in a food bank, though, you have the option between spending all of your day handing out food in the transactional kind of, here you go, you need a hamper, I'm going to help you, we're going to do that, the charitable model that is driven by our understanding that people are hungry. We, we as much as possible, resist just doing that. We set the number of hours for the food bank, we don't go over that, we spend our resources on other things as well, the food skills programs and the education programs, the advocacy work that we do. It's a really conscious effort and it's hard because our community members would tell us often, please open more, we want to be able to come to the food bank more. We could spend all of our money just on food in the food bank and all of our staff time just on the food bank. For us, that doesn't make any sense because that weighs everything into the emergency side of things and we don't believe that we can have any kind of meaningful impact on, on the change that we want to see, either for individuals in our community or for the broader system change we want to see if that's what we're doing. So our hope is that in trying to wrestle with that, and it's really a, a hard tension to wrestle with because people want they want us to be able to help them, um, and we, but they also want us to be able to look at the broader system piece. So that's the first piece, is that we really um, insist on, from our own organizational perspective, looking upstream, right? The notion that, um, you know, you see, you see the baby floating in the river, you go and you get the baby out of the river, and then you see another baby floating in the river, and you, oh my goodness, you go and get the baby. And you can keep on getting babies out of the river, or you can look up river, look upstream and try and figure out why this is happening. One of my colleagues said, you know, food banks are kind of like the tourniquet. You can, you can slow the bleeding, but unless you actually figure out where the bleed is, it's not going to help in the long run. And so I would say that we are both the tourniquet and the rest of the triage. We have to be looking upstream. We have to be looking for... Um, you know, what we know to be the causes of poverty and pushing to alleviate, eradicate, fundamentally change those. We need to be noisy. Uh, we, the STOP is a noisy organization. Uh, we manage to walk a certain line that is great alliances with all kinds of people uh, in the city, but also, um, you know, a certain, a certain sort of ability to piss people off because we actually call out the things that aren't working in our city and in our province and try to be as loud as we can about that. And I would say don't be distracted from the broader piece of work uh, that you have in front of you. Um, for us, we see the, the food justice system as, as very much the sort of development of a just food movement as, as very much part and parcel with our work. Um, I think that we often uh, see sort of different, different components, and food poverty is one piece of this, um, but there are other pieces as well. For so the sustainability piece, the local food, local economic development piece, it's all part of a broader system. And while we might focus very much on the poverty piece, for good reason, it doesn't mean that there aren't other uh, quite dynamic opportunities for us if we work in food. Uh, and, and unexpected ones as well. So I just thought I'd throw out a couple of examples that um, are currently quite interesting in Canada for you to sort of be aware of. Uh, the city of Vancouver is addressing some of this work in terms of being a, a, just, uh, a food justice site, one way or another, by establishing fairly aggressive targets. So they're actually going to increase by 50% in the next, whatever it is, seven years, I guess, since the time that they set this. Um, so they're talking about food assets, very specifically garden plots, orchards, urban farms, farmers markets, and they're in, you know, going to increase that by 50%. But if you don't have those targets, you can't really necessarily meet them, right? It will be more happenstance. So there are more cities in Canada that are looking at food assets very specifically that will enable us to have more growing, more food opportunities, more the kitchens will allow more of the community kitchens and skill, skill, skill building opportunities. Um, there's a fantastic, I, I put the link up there if you're interested, a fantastic program in rural New Brunswick um, where uh, a, a small school decided that they wanted to actually uh, change the quality of the food that was being served um, and the interaction with food. So they decided that they would work with local farmers 
Um, they changed the curriculum. They changed the content of the food in the cafeteria. They changed the activities in the school, both for the kids and for the lunch ladies, as they called them. So instead of just reheating you know, processed food, the lunch ladies are now cooking from scratch, which means that they have way more job satisfaction. They're growing food in the school and then using that, fo using that food in the cafeteria. The kids are involved in a social enterprise selling food. The farmers are delighted because they not only get to talk about the food, and there's this great piece at the beginning of the video where you know, a group of students go out to the farm and say, so where does a pork chop come from? Because he's a, a farmer, pig farmer. And, uh, and the kids said, well, from behind there. <laughs> And, you know, like in the, in the back of the supermarket. And he said, no, but where does it come from? And they all were really quiet. And one of them finally said, the lady with the hat brings them out. Because they have absolutely no idea where food comes from. But a couple of years in, oh, sorry. The link, yeah. Um, it's, sorry, it, it, it went to hyperlink. So it's uh, bfomedia.ca backslash preview backslash a-P-P-R-E-N-D-R-E -E backslash cafeteria <laughs> underscore anglais, which is English, <laughs> dot HTML. It's in French, but it has English subtitles. Sure. Yeah. Um, here's the other interesting thing. They have actually figured out that um, they can use in all of this, in this quite dynamic thing that's going on, 60% local food, 60%. Now, rural New Brunswick, I have to tell you, is not a place I would have thought you'd be able to use 60% local food ever. Um, it's quite amazing. It's also one of the provinces that is, I mean, economically in many ways, dying in Canada. So this is a huge piece. It, it, it is, it is a, with where you see those intersections of the food movement, it's not just about whether or not we're going to address poverty, but whether or not we're going to build healthier communities. And if we can work with a local economy and foster that kind of growth through the food system, it will have an enormous dividend for all of us, um, and in particular, this community. They're also labeling stuff as being local food. So, okay, I have a feeling I'm, I must be close to being done. I'm not sure you'll be able to see this. The other piece that I wanted to just refer to is that there are, increasingly in North America and in Toronto, we're looking at the impact that anchor institutions can have when we want to talk about a food justice system. So um, I always think about it as, you know, sort of the food, that, the money that we're going to spend, uh, you can either spend it, you know, buying something from far away, or you can spend it in your local economy. So procurement policies that actually favor really aggressive local food um, and who, and not just local food, but local businesses as well. So this is uh, the woman referred to here, Joshna, used to be a chef at the stop. She now runs the food system at one of the universities in the city. And she has, you know, talk about revolution, she has taken over that campus. She got rid of the multinational that was there providing food. Luckily, the contract was up. She got a new one in that was going to work with her that placed, as you, my eyes are so terrible. So investing in the vision of food for the university. And that means everything, again, from the scratch cooking. So she's not only had to sort of change the way the kitchens are, but change the skills of the people who work in the kitchen because they weren't actually doing any scratch cooking before. And, and the kids on campus, and we have food banks on university campuses in Canada. Did you know that? We have food banks. We have, we have universities actually allowing there to be food banks on campuses in Canada. Anyway. Um, Joshna's plan is to actually, you know, sort of take hold and to spend the money that was going to be spent, and it's a lot of money, and spend it in ways that are better for the food system. So the city of Glasgow, with their lovely statement that came out yesterday, city of Glasgow and, and Edinburgh, you know, sort of the commitment, one of the things that they could be doing is to say, you know, when we have meetings in Glasgow City Hall, when we have meetings in the, you know, throughout the city government, we're actually going to make a, we sort of set targets for how much of this will go to local food and local businesses, and even better still, local businesses that have a social purpose, right? So if we're spending this money, let's spend it in ways that reflect our values and that actually help grow our economy. Okay, I think that's almost it. There are a couple of other pieces just to say that in the US in particular, they're looking at creating some revenue streams by doing things like taxing colas or pop. Um, the crappier the food, the higher the tax. 
the, that revenue is then circulated back into health promotion programs. And in a couple of different jurisdictions in the US and in uh, Mexico and Brazil, they've actually linked them to really dramatically sort of lowering rates of, ob rates of obesity because they've been able to, you know, sort of both diminish the amount of of stuff that's being consumed and redirect it into public education. So that's another thought. I ha I'm hoping you guys don't actually get there, but that's, that's another option as well. And just to say that we work with chefs and restaurants around Toronto all the time. They help support our fundraising events. They come into the stop when we need them. Um, they take some of our, our, our community members as on as staff or volunteers. They're great allies, and I'm sure that that's something that you, you were also doing. And I thought I would leave, leave with this, perhaps not as cheerful as it might be, but um, more than anything else, uh, you know, if there is a possibility for, for Glasgow and Scotland to not be distracted um, from the fact that uh, this issue is not, is not about the, the, you know, sort of the presenting problem of food, it is about the poverty, um, and, uh, and to continue, continue to forge ahead with the peaceful revolution um, and, and the rest. Uh, I salute you and I look forward to hearing about the approach and the rest of the day. <laughs> Surprisingly, to those who know me, I've spoken a little bit longer than I should have, but if there are any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Um, that was the idea, so I'm happy to take them if there are any. Um, where, did you, where do you actually meet? What is your facility that you operate out of? Uh, and was that a, a facility you purchased or donated or rented or... Tell us more about that. Sure. Um, we started uh, started in the, in the church hall, went to another church hall, went to a community space. Where we are right now is in a social housing building, so Toronto Community Housing. They have um, about, I guess, 15 or 16 years ago, the organization moved there. Um, we, ha for many years, had a kind of rent-free agreement with them. We are currently just paying our expenses in that space. And that's where we have the food bank drop-in, the community advocacy office as well, so the main sort of space. Uh, in 2008, we did a capital campaign and renovated uh, an old uh, train barn, um, and that's the community that's in the, the more affluent community. It's, um, I'm sorry, I didn't think to bring any pictures of that. It's quite spectacular. That's where the greenhouse is. Uh, we, as an anchor tenant, we don't pay rent there. We pay again for our costs, which are not insubstantial given we're running a, a greenhouse. Um, we, we pay a small amount for the rent of the office space in that. So we've been, we've been very, very lucky. We're, what we've been able to say to Toronto Community Housing is that we bring an enormous social value to the community, and that's why we don't get charged rent. Um, that's, yeah, we're lucky. Hi, thank you very much for sharing uh, your stories from Canada. Um, I just had a quick question. You mentioned at the very beginning that you specifically do not means test everybody that comes into your facilities. Can you tell us about the pitfalls and the advantages that that has had throughout the processes? So has there been, uh, has it been overall positive or has there been some drawbacks to that? I, I don't think there are any pitfalls. I, I don't want to be too dogmatic about this. I don't think that there should ever be a means test. I think that if someone um, identifies, self-identifies as needing support, um, I would no sooner want to means test somebody so that they could receive a food hamper than I would want to means test them for whether or not they need to sit in a community kitchen and have company because they are depressed and socially isolated. I don't think that there is a, I don't think there's a reason, I don't believe that there are compelling reasons to means test. Um, if you think that you can't afford to do it because more people will come, um, then more people will come because they have that need. The one restriction that we have for both our perinatal program and our food bank is a geographic uh, restriction, and that's because of the, the funding arrangement that we have. Um, I'm not, which is not to say that there aren't challenges. If we didn't have the geographment 
kind of limitation, uh, then we would have that many more people and we'd be able to give out less food. But I can only imagine that there are pitfalls um, with, with means testing because it is so demeaning. Hi there. Um, thank you for a uh, very inspiring talk. Where are you? Uh, talk. Um, I'm Svenja from Urban Roots, um, involved in local community garden. Why, and why can't I see you? Oh, thank you. <laughs> I don't, sorry. Okay. Um, I uh, wanted to ask a bit more about um, access to land for growing. Um, that's quite a big problem here. Um, like, not just access, but also security of land um, to so remain available for growing space. Thanks. So uh, it, what I can tell you is that we, one of the big things that we're working on right now, and I'm sitting on the, the city's urban agriculture committee, is to try and get the city to kind of loosen its firm grip on uh, different growing spaces. Um, we have uh, completely underused spaces in public schools, in, in public social housing spaces. Um, there are a number of other places people are looking at um, under hydro corridors, which are not always great places to grow, but they can be, depending. Um, but it's a big part of, of the work that we're doing at the city right now, is to try and figure out how we can actually not just open them up for growing, but then open them up for things like market gardens, so that there will be a, an additional small amount of income. Um, there are increasing numbers of, of community gardens in parks. As an organization, we tend to focus more on the community garden than the allotment garden because it enables that community connection more. Um, so there, there are a number of different sort of smaller allotments in different places. There's a weird thing that happens with, uh, there's a weird reaction for many people to community gardens and allotment gardens. They, they tend to be kind of um, offended by the, how they look. And so it's, it's not, it's a, it's, I don't know if you have this, I can't remember if it was here or not, but you know, people putting their laundry out, there actually are you know, sort of prohibitive legislation against people being able to put up a laundry line because you don't, you know, they, they don't like the look of it. So it's, there's a bit of a weird thing that goes on in Canada and we have to kind of encourage people to understand that, that it's you know, sort of changed the aesthetic of it or their perception of the aesthetic. So to, to say mainly in the city of Toronto that we're moving with the city to try and get them to open up more of those spaces so there can be more growing. Um, and also looking at things like, uh, I mean, one of the things that we do throughout the year, in the winter in particular, is to talk about, you know, sort of um, how to do sort of gardening in, un, you know, in un, untraditional places, so balcony gardens and pot gardens and different things, because lots of the folks who come to the stop won't have a garden regardless. And the other thing that we do, I didn't mention it, is a program called Yes in My Backyard that matches together um, people who are interested gardeners with people who have space but don't have time to garden. Um, and it's been a, a very, very lovely experience because, you know, you often see... I mean, there are people who just say, I don't, you know, I don't care, so do whatever you want with it. Um, and the, the yield, the harvest is then divided between the gardeners and the, the owners of the property, or the, you know, sort of the people who have the yards, whether they own them or not. Um, and sometimes they're just spectacular stories of, you know, the one recently this past year of a, an older, I think they were Polish couple who didn't speak any English and who, you know, we were a little bit worried about matching them up with this young couple who had a little kid and we weren't sure if it was going to work. And by the end of the summer, you know, they have, the young couple goes away, they give them the keys to the house, they're, you know, having dinners together on a regular basis. It doesn't always happen that way, but it can, right? And that's the thing. So that's another one of the, the means we're pursuing. Hi there, um, Claire from Food Matters. Thank you so much for um, your talk. Um, my colleagues and I have actually followed your organization for many years with deep envy and would love to do similar work over here. Um, community projects that we work with in the UK um, spend their time, it seems, just firefighting and never have the opportunity to develop as you yeah. have. And um, so I wondered if you could just say something about your financial model. I mean, you've mentioned fundraising quite a lot, but mm -hmm. I wondered if you had anything to share about fundraising that we can learn from. Obviously, it's a different financial situation, but something about your, how you finance um, the project. Thank you. Yeah, this, this may only distress you, though, so I'll just say that right up front. Um, we are unusual. We get less than 10% of our revenue from any government sources. We fundraise all the time. 
It is a huge part of my job. Um, we host enormous events over the course of the year. And I will just say, because this is one of the pieces that I find quite bizarre about our organization, um, I inherited this, this model. I've only been at the stop for a while. But one of the ways that we do this work, and it's not without its benefits, but we have very large, big, high ticket price events. Um, so very high, $300 was the last event, our biggest event of the year, which means that, not surprisingly, this is not, uh, this is not an event that I would go to ever. If I, I mean, in the not-for-profit, I wouldn't be able to afford to go. Uh, we have restaurants, the high, you know, sort of some of the best restaurants in the city, wineries making donations. They come, they provide pretty much whenever we ask. They come to events. And uh, so that largest event, which is called What's on the Table, the $300 ticket price, I think that we raised about $330,000, which is about 150,000 pounds, roughly. Um, we have three of those a year, those, those um, kinds of events, and that's largely uh, sort of, you know, that, there's a big chunk of money that comes from that. Um, it is a complete contradiction if you work in the world of poverty, it fries my brain, the, the good part of it is that it does actually mean that we are sort of constantly having conversations with people who are affluent, who are close to decision makers, who are, in, you know, sort of in a, in a different part of the world. Um, and so we, we broker a lot of, uh, of awareness that way. You know, more needs to be done, not surprisingly. Um, we get a lot of funding from private foundations, from family foundations and lots from major donors. And those are really, I mean, we actually get very little from corporations, um, but that's, that's the model that we have, events, foundations, major donors. Um, we, we have, I think, four or five staff who are fundraisers out of the 35. It's a big part of our work. And I, when I say that it is, you know, at, at least a third of my time is on fundraising. Very few other organizations, in my experience in the not-for-profit in Toronto, have that. Part of the problem is that we have so little government support. Um, and so we're sort of trying to change that a little bit um, and see whether we can get more support, especially for the drop-in program in particular. But we stand kind of somewhat outside of that. The good news is it, it means that we're not beholden to government funders. And we can, as I said, did I mention that we sometimes piss people off? Sometimes we do. And we can. Um, but it, it does mean that we spend an awful lot of time fundraising. <laughs> uh, my name is uh, Angus McIntosh from Castlemilk Law Centre and uh, I was looking at your website as well and, and from this morning's uh, talk I, I, was, I was really impressed with all the things you're doing but I, I, we've been working down at uh, the, the Social Trust South East Glasgow Food Bank over the past six months and uh, it's been going for about three years and when it started it was uh, feeding 600 people in 2012 uh, for all of Glasgow because it, it was one of the first ones and uh, now it's feeding 6,000 people. So, uh, although I'm really impressed with what you're doing, I'd rather uh, it didn't quite get to the, the stage yeah. you're at and went back to feeding a few hundred people. But I just wondered if you had any thoughts on uh, how we might uh, get to that, how we might avoid uh, so many people needing food banks and how the food bank uh, groups could, uh, could try and contribute to that. I, I, it was your wife who wanted the revolution. I'm not, I'm not going to say I don't disagree with her. Um, I, Honestly, you, 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 you know, the reporter that I spoke to yesterday, I can't remember what the paper was, but, you know, she said, is it a bit of a tipping point? It's a critical time. It's a critical time. It's a critical time. It, it, you know, we now have food banks embedded in all manner of our social policy response. We have governments creating tax incentives for farmers and corporations to make donations to food banks. It, it is, there is no advice except to say that the city, the community, needs to, you know, follow up on, for example, the press release that was released yesterday, follow up anywhere you can to say this cannot, apart from the fact that it is completely immoral, it doesn't work. Food banks, and I, I'm there, <laughs> I know many of you are, it doesn't matter how hard we try, it is a bottomless pit that the system of a food bank is never, ever, ever going to be able to feed people when they are hungry because the system of a food bank is not actually addressing poverty. You can do the tourniquet work, but if we're not actually doing that bigger work, if we're not calling out our governments 
and calling out people who are willing to kind of maybe let this one go, to say this cannot be how it goes. I know you're going to hear later from somebody I met yesterday about why this is a human rights matter and as it should be framed as a human rights discussion. And maybe that's the way to go. But I, I, I don't know what else to say except that the push needs to be on and the galvanizing that needs to be happening for your communities because it will be in the blink of an eye that you suddenly realize, how did this happen? You've already gone up 300% or something in the last five years. It's only going to keep happening. And to governments who think that they can kind of get off, that they can you know, shirk their responsibility or, or, or count on the voluntary sector, the, the very, very clear evidence needs to be it doesn't work. It doesn't keep people from being hungry. It, it will cause enormous health issues for us, which we will pay for down the road. So let's not do it. Let's stop now. We've gone far enough down this road. It's clearly only getting worse. If you've gone up by 10% in, in, did you say four years, three years? Yeah. So I would say to any government who is proposing to use a food bank as a model and proposing to use that in your social policy response, just show us one jurisdiction where it has worked, only one. And I will, you know, apologize. Just one where people actually have stopped being hungry and it has stopped being an emergency response. If, if this is supposed to be an emergency, then there should be an end to it. You know, an, a food bank should be what happens when in Canada, when, we, you know, when there's a flood, when people lose their housing, when there's a fire. That's what an emergency response is. An emergency response is not because poverty is okay. It cannot be. It cannot be. Poverty cannot be okay. It cannot be that people are asked to live this way, that they are sanctioned if they don't look for enough job in a market that doesn't have enough jobs for people. I, don't, I, I honestly don't know what to tell you apart from the peaceful revolution. The absolute insist, insistence that your community, that your Scotland, that your Glasgow must be better than this.